called uh, Katchik's office today uh, and left them a message that we were considering this tonight for committee and that we would, we would be on the agenda. There's two separate ones. One goes to the controller's office, the other goes to the Department of State. They're both a wealth of information. It's kind of hard to break it down. Budget reappropriation, Moiston Street demolition. Hello. Hello. So, in front of you, you have a request for a budget reappropriation to the 2013 budget. Uh, late in 2013, specifically on December 26, there was a fire on Moiston Street, which resulted in um, five buildings having to be demolished. Fire was actually on the 24th. We did the demolition on the subsequent days. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yes, exactly. But the fire is on the 20 on the 26th, and then there were five structures and a condemned structure that um, uh, have been demolished. One of them recently, as the mayor points out. Um, so, in order to support this expense, which will not exceed seventy-nine thousand dollars, I am proposing that we take some money from lines in the 2013 budget that at this point in time we know we have available budget and move them into the appropriate spot so that we can pay for this um, since we went out and did the um, uh, request for quotes in December of 2013. Uh, and this way we can use our 2013 funds to pay for the demolition as opposed to 2014. Okay, so we're pulling Forty grand out of Social Security line. Yes. And nineteen some change out of Siemens maintenance contract. What right. That, you would think that would kind of be locked in. What, well, why is actually, that a variable it, number? it would would have been, except that in the 2013 budget, <coughs> it was actually budgeted for more than once. 
So more money than we needed to was budgeted in 2013 for that expense. How many times was it budgeted? Uh, well, twice that okay. I could see. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if, it, if you know, I, I say that, but what I, obviously I wasn't here for the development of that budget. It could have been that we were thinking on expanding what we were going to do with them, so I don't know necessarily that it was truly an whoops as much as there was more funds there than was needed. Okay, and the 14 budget is budgeted for? For the appropriate amount of money, and it's in the Bureau of Services budget. Excellent. Any questions? Concerns. I'll move it. Is there a second? Second. second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. We're reappropriated. Uh, next item of 2014. Yes. Reappropriation yes. capital equipment. <coughs> in your approved capital budget, there are certain pieces of equipment for streets and waste um, replacement equipment uh, for those two areas. And if the city were to wait until the sale of 2014 bonds, which will be in um, May, when we would actually have the proceeds from that sale, we would not, uh, Mr. Olson, I should say Commissioner Olson, would not be able and his staff to place the order for this equipment until then. This equipment has a rather long lead time. So in order to um, assure that the city receives this equipment uh, in a timely manner, i.e. greater than or earlier than the end of this year or early next year, what we're proposing is to temporarily appropriate some of our unrestricted fund balance. We ended the year of 2012 with a $3.6 million balance. So we're saying we're going to earmark that so that we can do a purchase order and have money attached to it. Send out the purchase order knowing full well we're not taking delivery of equipment until after we sell our uh, bond anticipation notes in May. When we receive the proceeds from the bond anticipation notes, we would then um, really reverse this entry, quote unquote, pay back the unrestricted um, fund balance that we're using to support the purchase orders. Because you can't, the city can't go out and give a purchase order to a vendor without having some cash behind it. So that's really what this is intended to do. It's recognizing that the council has uh, adopted the capital budget, that it intends to issue the bond anticipation notes, but it is allowing us to move forward with this purchasing, put it on the books, get the vendors to get going to fill the order ahead of waiting until when we would normally do this in May. Okay. Does this change what we're buying under this? I mean, this cabin chassis, the plow, all this stuff is stuff that was already on. Exactly. Okay, so it's not changing any exactly quantities or on. adding any equipment. No. Okay, same stuff we were exactly. planning, just mm -hmm. doing it early. Okay. Yes. Any questions, concerns, thoughts? Yes. Just one, that if, as long as the legislation states that the money is going to go back um, yes, it will. And, um, uh, it is in here that that will be the yeah. case, and, and we'll work with legal to make sure that that is the case in the legislation that you, you approve. Anything else? We're good? Yeah, yeah. I move it? Yes. A second? second. All in favor? Aye. 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 We're reappropriated. Anything else to come before the Finance Committee? I have a motion to. So moved. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, I'm going to call the order city development and planning. Uh, first item on the agenda is uh, whether we want to do a, a resolution in support of Senator Katchik's bill uh, to try and consolidate the two primary election dates. Is there any question or comment? Okay, okay. moved by Ms. Porterfield, seconded by Ms. Barrasso? Yep. Okay. All in favor? I <laughs> honor the words. Okay. Um, Chuck, a couple weeks ago, sent out um, a list of some of the different boards that are existing out there that are either obsolete or um, some that we may need to want to re you know, re what I want to say, restructure, get them back up and running again. Um, and I thought maybe we could just run through each of these and, and see if we, again, decide we want to reconstitute some of them, we can get moving on that. Um, first one was the Affirmative Action uh, Advisory Board. <coughs> um, I don't know how long it has not existed, but Ms. Porterfield? Um, I don't know how long it hasn't existed either, but I think it's a board that really needs to um, become functional again. 
Um, as we know, we heard from the affirmative action officer last year, and we're um, pretty flat in terms of our um, affirmative action hiring. So I would think that perhaps this board could be um, of some assistance in helping us move that forward and increase our, our, our numbers. So if this is a board that isn't exist is not in existence right now or not functioning right now, I suggest that we um, get it functioning again. Okay. Any other comments or thoughts on that? I agree. I mean, we're not meeting our percentages right now. So if we could have a board to maybe help us move toward that goal with a, a stronger, you know, forward motion, I think that would be a good thing. Okay. Mr. Riggie? Yeah, I'm in agreement, too. We've got to get this board up and running again because, I mean, we've heard about this for a long time where we had some problems. So let's get it going. Mm -hmm. Mr. Erickson? Oh, I agree. I mean, but uh, one of the things I see here is required that there's nine members or nine seats in this board. Uh, we'll have to find nine people who want to be, inter you know, be interested in serving. So let's get the word out if it's something we're going to fill that anyone who's interested, mm -hmm. you know, let it be known. Mm -hmm. um, because sometimes finding people to sit in these boards is harder than you might imagine. So uh, right. people that are interested, speak up. Um, the next one is the Central Park Stage Committee. And I don't know. I mean, the stage is obviously being used mm -hmm. all summer, but it's, it's uh, I believe, yeah, with Mona Gold's <coughs> program. So I don't know that we need a, a committee to review this. This is one I think we can delete. Currently, there's someone, thank you. There's someone who's doing this, right, Mona Gold? Yeah, she's been the one who's been running the program there. So, all right, so we'll scratch that one. Uh, Tuesday in the park and Colonial Festival, um, obviously. Me, oh, yes. Uh, are you saying that you want legislation? So oh, yes. this from the chapter? Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. That's okay. Call for public Pardon? Okay. Code changes. All right, so, so we do have to change, call hearing. for a public hearing. Right. Okay. Well, um, I'll, let's do them at the end, and I'll just entertain them. Motion to call for a public hearing on the ones that we want to delete. Does there need to be a public hearing for each one separate and a separate so announcement, or do you want no, all the changes? You can do it as long as all the changes are referenced in the uh, proposed legislation. So we want to call for public hearing on all of them? Yeah. So we'll do it at the end. Well, no, on the one for affirmative action, which was the first one. If you're not changing it. That, that one we wouldn't have to do. Right. But we yes. can group them together and just call for one public hearing right. on the ones that we need to the code changes for the ones we're going to delete. Um, okay, so again, like Tuesday in the Park doesn't exist anymore, and Colonial Festival has certainly been scaled way back. If, so I think we can delete that one also. Um, police Objective Review Committee. <coughs> that sounds like the civilian police review. Yes. Committee. It's even not. made up of the same it's appointments, mm -hmm. so it's you know it's just been kind of reinvented. Yeah, so I think we can take delete that one. Or you so how does it currently go ahead? So how does it currently exist if it's you know in our in our um, in the codes? If, if, if this is what's where we're talking about deleting, and there is a civilian police review board, where is it currently? Mm -hmm. It exists as the Civilian Police Review Board. Remember, Chuck said yeah, us all the mm -hmm. guidelines that in the code, right? Different Pardon name. Please. Different name. Yeah. Yes, different name. Yeah, it's yeah. committee. Yeah. 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 Okay. okay. But it exists in the code. Okay. Yeah, yeah. the, the police, Civilian Police Review Board is in the code as the Civilian okay. Police Review Board. Okay, I just want to make sure we're not this this just start old, calling it something else. Pork. <laughs> and then delete. It was called pork uh, back in the day, just oh, okay. the review committee. Oh. Okay. Yeah. okay. That's what it was. It was, that's right. I remember that. No one wanted to be in the port board. Okay. Housing Standards Review Board. And I don't know that we have a need for anything like that. Well, you know, we it's talked about, you know, slick, the, the landlord's group was interested in the Housing Standards Review Board. Oh, that's right. Um, <clears throat> existing. So I'm not sure we need to move forward on that right now to do anything about it, but maybe we should, for the sake of ease of starting it up, should we get to that point again, have it exist? Leave this one alone. Yeah. I, th yeah, I, I, I think we should leave this alone and not uh, delete it. From okay. 
Okay. Yeah, I, I don't think we need to do anything, but I think we need to let it sit there for now. Well, it's not taking much space either. <laughs> no, it's not, yeah, two sentences. Yeah. Right? So if you know, we <laughs> decide to do it, we can expand on it as, a, as opposed to having to bring something back. Right. Correct. Yep. Okay. Environmental Conservation Commission. Hmm, kind of think we can remove it. Mm. Or. The advisor, I think, is Mr. Pine, I'm sorry, excuse me. So. Okay. When's the last time it was even uh, in existence? I have not a clue. Oh, I'll look at the mayor because he was. He was when the last was the <laughs> sign? I guess. Yeah. I, I did. Uh, never served on it? Yeah, it was. It was a man's We have a committee that specifically works on like to preserve and things like that. So it's more like people taking up yes, environmental specific. causes in their own neighborhoods. Yeah. And, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So take it out. Okay. Economic Development Zone Administrative <coughs> Board. This one met. People. I know. I know. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Fifteen members. Uh, well, and again, we now have Metroplex in place and the economic development teams and it's, it's a different animal now. It looks like Metroplex it has uh, Schenectady, Glenville, mm -hmm. County Legislature. I mean, it has. It's kind of interesting. It's more of a county board than a county board. Well, but it didn't have the other towns, or does it? I think it's just the area, the areas that were part of the economic development zone. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. So, okay, we'll eliminate that. And the Dare Advisory Committee, obviously, that doesn't exist anymore. So. <laughs> All right. So I will entertain a motion to call for a public hearing on the proposed changes to the committee. Structure. So moved. Okay, second by Ms. Second. Porterfield. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. All right. Um, then, item number three. Um, two, two weeks ago, we agreed that we would come back and revisit the RFP process. Um, and you should have all, you've all gotten emails from Mr. Winkler and Mr. Wallen. So I'm going to ask them to come up and kind of walk us through their proposed process. and. Uh, See if everybody's on board with it. Thanks, Peg. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, I hope everyone's had an opportunity to read what was in their packet, uh, the guidelines that I put together. Um, while RFPs are can be used for more than one thing, it's usually used around here to obtain services, professional services. Um, to solicit help with, with putting a project together. And I'm going to go over the, just the highlights of this because you have it in front of you, but, and then we can open it to discussion. The basic components are the demonstration of the scope, what we want the, this company to provide to us, the requirements of the proposal and how they have to submit their proposal to us. Third thing is selection criteria that what they're going to be judged based on. And we look for an estimated cost. Uh, most of the time, these projects are not well enough to find to write a specification for to go to uh, bid. So we're using the RFP to help us in that regard. So we're looking for an es estimated cost, and that's what is provided. Um, then we advertise through BidNet and the Gazette and whatever other means we have that we would like to use at that particular time for that project. Then there's an evaluation team established of knowledgeable people. We try to keep it between three people and, and five people. They evaluate the proposals based on the criteria that was established, come out with a numerical evaluation meet with all the members of the team as many times as necessary to end up with a recommendation 
to come to management. <coughs> Once management is, agrees is that winner is selected and we go into the negotiation for the contract where you put together exactly what is going to take place and, and the amount of money. In your packet, there are two new things that I put in there based on discussions that we had. And they are, uh, first, there should be a, a definite designation of chairman for the review team. Uh, I would imagine that it would usually be the department head for the particular area that was involved. Uh, we believe the council should designate a representative as well. Uh, in general, this person could be someone that oversees all RFPs. It could be someone that is assigned to just one RFP, maybe the chairman of the committee that, that covers this particular topic, or pass the responsibility around so all the, the council folks have equal opportunity to participate in this, in this uh, activity. Um, then we would meet, the two, the two chair people would meet to discuss the RFP as it's being presented. The person from the council could be an ex officio member of the, of the team, sitting in on all the deliberations that take place. Um, certainly talking about the, the recommendations and hopefully everybody ends up being able to make an agreement on the recommendation. Um, the other thing that has changed is into the guidelines we put recommendations for the five guides of how these RFPs are going to be evaluated. They're on the last page of your of your handout. Mm -hmm. And and weights. Now, what was taken <coughs> in the past, the, the cost weighed into the factor of actually that done making a selection of a qualified candidate, then you looked at the cost to see if the cost was reasonable. Now we're going to propose that it be part of the numeric evaluation and what part it is would be agreed upon by the two chair people before before the RFP went out and the number of, of area of factors that we evaluate would also be agreed to by the two chair people so you'd end up with a numeric evaluation that would include the, the, the cost Granted, it's an exception. It's an estimated cost. So, yeah, I think the, the value that was put in or should be put in, as, as I mentioned in the, in the handout, is is a rather low one because you want to get a quality project by selecting the, the most qualified uh, respondee, but also marry in some portion of the cost. So that is what you have in front of you. Um, some of it's new, some of it's what we've been doing for a long time. So, um, open for discussion. Um, um, Ms. Porterfield? <laughs> Mr. Winkler, are you saying that the, this 10% that, that's included at the end now is the part where you include the cost? Is that what you're saying that is? I'm saying that right now the cost <coughs> didn't have a, a specific percentage. Uh -huh. But if you look at that last page, I'm suggesting that the cost in there be a value of 20 to 40 percent. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the technical evaluation be the remainder. Okay. And that is up to the two chair people before you start doing anything. Okay. And you, you assess what, what component you want in there. And the rest of the components on the technical side is fair game as well. You got percentages that, that they are there. And, and that was just based on my experience and, and what we've done with RFPs in the past. So. Other questions, comments, suggestions? Go ahead. Um, when we have, re you know, like let's say three to five reviewers and our reviewers' scores 
there's a huge difference between them. Can you, okay, let's say we, we, rate, we have our five reviewers and one reviewer rates someone, I don't know, a 30 and someone else does it at a 70. Um, do we consider, take that consideration or do we then meet after, not, does the team then meet after that to discuss that to see, you know, where one person thought this was a 30 versus someone else thought that was a 70 and how do we resolve that? That, that is all fair game when you sit and discuss what you have as a score, what I have as a score, and it's really relative, you know, who you rank, one, two, three, four, who I rank, one, two, three, four, it doesn't really matter on, on the actual score, it's, it's who you thought was number one, who Chris thought was number one, and why, and that's, you know, we sat there, our first meeting was probably two, two and a half hours, mm -hmm. Just, just talking about what you did, why you did it, you know, because you look at a, a proposal differently than I would at a proposal. Your opinion could help me with my final determination and vice versa. So the, the, the discussion is very good sitting at the table and finding out what everybody thought about. And Chris could speak for himself, but I found that, you know, you had, I made alterations in what I had based on what other people saw, and then, and then I would look back at the proposals, say, yeah, okay, I may, may not have given that enough weight or too much weight, and so it, you reassess based on what everybody else is, is talking about, you know. And that's how we come to a, con to a conclusion, and then hopefully we end up with a unanimous uh, decision on who the, who the recommendation would be. Sometimes you probably wouldn't, but it would have to be the majority you know, recommended. That's why I think five is a good number to have. So you have a lot of different input, and you can get a lot of different expertise uh, weighing in on it. We did suggest that maybe we have at least one person from uh, that's not a uh, city employee for that very reason. And we've had that. We've, we've, we've done that recently. <laughs> Mr. Erickson? Um, what about, uh, kind of off of what Marion was speaking a little bit, um, in terms of training the reviewers on how to, you know, do the evaluation. Um, I think one of the concerns that you know, I've seen is, you know, when you're, when you're kind of going through this process, there needs to be a set of standards and rules because some things are subjective. You know, we said, hey, how, how attractive is something? You might find it more or less attractive than the next reviewer. Uh, and so the scores can be quite varied because it's very subjective. But where we have something like uh, price or uh, something like that, which is very the opposite direction, not subjective at all, um, <coughs> you'd expect the scores to be more in line with one another. And so I think it's important from when I looked at scoring from other you know, things that we've done like this, that the reviewers really didn't understand how to do the scoring. And so if I gave a high score for something that I thought was good, and you gave a low score for something you thought was good, maybe they're, they're actually working in the opposite direction, which is gonna give you, when you summarize them together, you're gonna get the wrong answer. And so um, I think it's important to make sure that the reviewers understand an educator or a teacher would put a rubric together uh, uh, that kind of says these are the guidelines that you know good is between here and here average is between here and here and poor is between here and here because clearly we've seen situations where uh, the subjective nature um, actually doesn't add up when you, when you look at the results so it's a lot of a difficult area it, it, by its very nature it is subjective you know, you, you come to it with a different background than I come to it with. Uh, but I think the range is where you would fall. If you're a hard scorer, for example, and I'm an easy scorer, okay. we may end up with the same number one. So that's what we're looking for, is who did you select as the number one candidate? Who did you select? Who did I select? And that's where the discussions come in, and why. It, the, the scores give you an opportunity within your own scoring system to to rank them. Right. 
but they don't mer they don't enter into the deliberations at the table. It's who you thought who you thought was number one, two, and three. So it's it's it's, it's somewhat clinical at first. But then all we're really looking for is who you thought was the best candidate. Yeah, I, mean, I was just going to just say that to, to Bill's point, I understand what you're talking about, is that we had five people sit down and actually six for something like the Clinton course. And we've done this before on several occasions with other projects such as Erie Not Roundabout where we also got ten proposals and we, you know, we reconvene, we wait for two weeks, we evaluate, we did not have even though I agree that what you're talking about is a good idea to let people know what we're looking at, you know, we didn't have that conversation, so it was 100% pure, to use a word. And everyone went back and they scored and they came back, and you know, the top five is, was the top five. You know, we, we had a little bit, and when we had discussions, it was, you know, how that process worked. And one of the other variables that we have when we have a, a group of five is the group of five may have different experiences, and I think that also plays in where you say, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> And not, not just project team experience, but we had uh, you know uh, prior history with the city. We had that as a one one it was uh, you know I might not have worked with a certain group, but someone from outside might have worked from that group, and they might have had a different experience. That experience that they had goes into that score of that firm, and we might not know that until we sit down at the table and somebody says, "Listen, I worked on this project. I thought that that firm well, they were good on paper. I didn't think it came out at the end, and they you know that that has to filter into there somewhere." But the conversation is always the, the best part of it. I haven't found that, you know, when we've done things, we are getting this jumbled. I mean, maybe someone's two or someone's three or someone's four or someone's, but it's not this wide spectrum. So I don't I don't think the process is, is broken as some think. I just think it needs a little bit more refinement so to make sure that everyone knows what we're doing because I've been comfortable with the process. Every time I've come here and made a recommendation, I've been comfortable that I think that that is the best team for the city. Right. So, so to ask a question then, in terms of experience, if I was if I was a raider and I said, okay, experience. If I have worked with the firm before, I would give them, and I had a good experience, you'd have a 10. If you worked with them before and you had a bad experience, you'd give them a zero. If you've never worked with them before, do you give them a 10 or a zero or a five? But how was, you know, like, mm -hmm. so, so there's certain things like experience, and that way, if you were to do it that way, well then the people you've worked with before are always going to get the job because that, that, the people you've worked with before and did a good job are going to get the next job and we're never going to get so many new because, well, why would change if, if it's not working? We, we talked about that at our, yeah. at, at our meeting and it was, it was a point brought up, it was how, how do you weigh that and I, I'm told exactly what you said is that, you know, a lot of people think it's an advantage, sometimes it isn't because sometimes that experience isn't always positive so sometimes it goes back down but it is, I didn't know if you had a... Well, I think... Carl, I don't think the experience that I understood as being, and not, there was a question, have you ever worked with the city before? To me, right. the experience is, what is the firm's experience that, that you're looking at? That right. was a different, right. those are different questions. Right, so therefore you got two raiders who interpreted the question differently. So no, the question was clear. The question was, did you work for the city before? And then there was a different one, the experience of the firm. Those were two different Overall questions. experience. Overall experience, meaning experience. have they done that work before right. or, yes. right. or the city's experience with them? Oh, the overall experience. Yeah. Overall experience. What, question? Of, okay, because what kind of work have they done in the past? Right. Okay, so I think there's opportunity for the two, two raiders might Clarify. rate it differently, right? Well, so, I mean, I think it's important to, to keep. Words, I think, right? That's what the meeting is right. for, Carl. That's yeah. what the meeting's for, is to get together and say yeah. that, you know, you got a, you got a proposal from cover to cover. It should, it, it should stand on its own. If, if there's experience in there that, that demonstrates their capabilities, it should, be, it should be presented. You know, and it's not what you might have personally knowledge, it's, it's what they did. You know. And it doesn't have to be in the city. You know, it could be it could be any place. They've got they've got experience doing this type of thing that you're looking for, and they put it into their proposal. So, and it, I think if you misinterpret or not misinterpret, but if you interpreted it to be one way and I interpreted it to be another, that would come out in the discussion in our meetings. That, geez, maybe I maybe I looked at it wrong. Maybe it should be the way you you think. And then you go back. You know, it's not. We don't have one meeting. We we have several meetings. And many as it takes to, to for everybody to be comfortable that we're doing what we're 
Foster Bush Hill. Ms. Prasso. Um, I know a number of us have had in-depth conversations on this, and I think we're in a, I think the, the structure of what you put together is really good. I just have two small things, and I guess they kind of dovetail with what Carl's saying, and I think they're minor. Number one, that we attach the rate, range of numbers to something, whether it be a letter grade like everybody understands in school, say, okay, well, if you think this project has an A, give it between 60 and 50. You know, I think it's just, or make it excellent. You know, excellent, very good, good, fair, poor. You know, what, whatever, but just give people a range to work in. I agree, I think that just takes like the guesswork out of it for people. Um, and then the only other thing is the, the different things that you have listed here, like firm and project team experience, maybe you just flush it out just a little bit. Look and say something like, look for things like what the team has done in the past, who they've worked with, what types of projects they've worked on. You know, just flesh that out for people because if I'm sitting in a room by myself looking through these proposals, Carl's right, it, it does leave a little bit open to interpretation. I think just a couple more words and we're there. I think the process is tight. I think it's good. I'm comfortable with it. When you just, say what the team has done in the past, the review team? Uh, no, I'm just saying, just, no, kind of just talk about, about this, out. this part, the, mm -hmm. you know, the percentages, mm -hmm. just flesh them out just a little bit. So where it says firm and project team experience, say, you know, what you're looking for here is blah, 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 blah. You know, not the experience you've had with the firm, rather the type of experience that the firm has within doing this scope of work. Just so it's less to interpretation, but other than that, I think, you know, you guys worked really hard on this. We've kind of asked every kind of strategic question <laughs> there is to try to combat the subjective part. No, I just wanted to jump in short. One of the issues that we've seen come up, though, is exactly mm -hmm. what we are giving you for backup to review, the timing of it, how you feel that you've had enough time to review it. And I know that uh, you know, I met with Marion before we brought anything you know, with, the, with the golf course to council so that we could talk about this and, and I could prepare my backup material to what, what we wanted. And the, what, what came up was, uh, you know, we have a varying degree. With the concessions, for example, we had two. We could compare and contrast those word for word of the proposal and it would be the same amount of effort. With something like this, we have 11. With something like Oak Street, we have 10. <coughs> North Fair, we may have another 10. So how detailed do we get with the strength of the project team? We talked about at the meeting shortlisting. However, if someone doesn't make the shortlist and you come and ask me, why didn't they make the shortlist? Am I revisiting <coughs> my evaluation? Am I scoring it again? Do I have to revisit it? Because one of the problems that we had was, once again, with the communication like you were talking about was, one of our evaluators, you know, we said, listen, we'll evaluate it. We went through and did it numerically. And then we talked and I said, listen, is there any way you could put some comments to each one? And he said, oh my God, he goes, I want to go back through if I got to do comments because I want to make sure my comments are direct. So he had to go back through, review them all again the next weekend to make sure those comments are there. So I don't want to have to burden everyone with multiple reviews. If you would like 11 <coughs> proposals, thoroughly reviewed with comments for why we took away points, the strengths of the team, the strengths of their experience, broken out for the highlights for each category for 11, we can, we can do that. It's just time. But if, if we're talking short lists, are we talking, the other thing I wanted to make sure we get into is interviews. Do you, do, you know, if we do them in one hand because we're not comfortable, if we do them, we, uh, we don't do them because we are comfortable, I want to make sure you don't think that that is some kind of a, uh, out that we're going around, you know, there's kind of working things I want to make sure we settle. Yeah. So <clears throat> I, I, I agree with you in the sense that, you know, going through, you know, the people, the five people who are evaluating, some of them are volunteers, or, you know, to burden them with, you know, 60 hours worth of labor to, to go through something like that might be excessive. So what I think Lisa was saying is that in the descriptions of these five categories, explain because the raters are not I mean, you're an engineer you do this you've done it before this is what you've been trained to do this is common sense to you if you've not been on a rating system before some of it might be what you might think is common sense might be kind of confusing or somebody might just interpret differently depending on you know what what their background is and so 
you know, availability of individuals on a project team, well, I might say, well, I'd like to know the schedules of everyone who's working on it, but if someone wrote, we're available, I guess that means you get 10 points because you're available, right? I mean, so there's so many ways that you can interpret just a availability of the individual project team. I really would like to say, have it say, if all members have an opening in their schedule, it's kind of a yes or no. Are you available? You're not available. You know, and so I, I struggle with, you know, one contractor getting a 10 and another contractor getting a 5 and somebody else getting a 1 if they all say, we're available. Right? I mean, how do you rate somebody on availability? I, I wouldn't know. It's, you're either available, I mean, unless you do a check to see if they're lying to you, but they're either available or they're not available. So it's either a 10 or a 1. And so for one firm to get a drastically different score than another, just, I don't know how you would interpret that differently. So explain specifically how you want the rater to score. If all 10 people are there for a block of a month and you get a better score than if people are overlapping and maybe not available for the whole thing. So, so I think there needs to be an explanation of how to use those scoring mechanisms. And I think that would, because everyone doing it differently, you know, may, you know, at the end of the day, you might come up with your top, you know, who's your favorite? But if you're looking at 11 of them, it's kind of hard even for an individual to come up with their favorite if they're changing the way they score based on the Thing they review. If they're looking at a fancy, you know, proposal that has m more color pictures in it than the other, they may go, "I like that one better because it looks prettier." You know, again, these are not engineers that are always doing this. It could be other people who would say, "Well, that's better looking. It's pretty. Look at the glossy pictures. They're my favorite." <laughs> and so the scoring needs to be broken down and given specific instructions. That's how you. I think that's how you have to do it. Um, and then just as another point for the council. Um, you know, this one I think we did well in the sense that we're clearly having plenty of discussion on it before we move it out, but sometimes when we do have things that come before us, we hear it, we get the pitch, and then we vote on it, and it comes out of council, and then we go back and do some more thinking overnight or over the next week, and may, our minds get changed, and we send it back to committee, and it gets a little of a bumpy road in terms of how, how it flows through. I think sometimes maybe we should make sure that almost work a cycle through and, and, and plan ahead so we have a cycle so that you guys pitch the idea to us, we're able to sit on it, think about it, really absorb it, ask questions, maybe receive, you know, some things might involve receiving phone calls from the public who say we don't want that, we do want this, and uh, make us think of some other aspects that maybe we're not thinking about in the 15 minutes we have to, to decide and vote. So I think putting a cycle of time in there might be helpful too. And I think also that the idea of having one of us as sort of an ex officio member of the, the team, that can kind of feed into that too. That could you help, know, yeah. Yeah, again, it would, it would help. We, where we can try to keep people appraised of you know what's going on and what's coming forward and yeah. stuff. Ms. Porterfield. Um, just what Mr. Erickson was saying regarding the pictures and all that stuff. I just, you know, we, we talked about what, um, when someone submits a proposal that there are pretty specific guidelines. And if it says five pages, it's um, in, in of, of um, the proposal, and that's all that, that they're looking for. So not to even get that other stuff included, because that gives may give someone an edge is what you're talking about. So those pictures would not be would not be even considered. So uh, frankly, um, and, and uh, I've done reviewing, and if you submit more than you're asked for, it never even sees gets to the reviewing process because it, it goes outside the guidelines. But um, that's... For you, right? No, so no, else, before, no, like no it doesn't get... It doesn't oh, does it get come, to, come to the review? That's right, because it says, like, it has to be one-inch margins, this much, this size font, mm -hmm. and if you don't do that, then, then you need to follow the directions, and so it never gets there. So the um, the picture thing is not being it's not being considered, you know. You have glossy paper and nice brochure and all the other extra bells and whistles, that's not what's being considered when, um, as I understand it, when we're looking at these RFPs. So just wanted to make sure that people understood that. <laughs> that if you can afford better paper, doesn't mean that we're going to look at you a little closer. That's not. Okay. That's interesting that we do it that way. Because, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've seen it both ways. And I just was going to comment, too, on um, one thing Mr. Winkler said. You know, I've served on a review panel for the County Initiative Program grants, which are grants funding for the arts. And it's, it's an industry go through this exact same process. And it's interesting, you know, is, is I tend to score things a little bit higher than some of my colleagues do. But again, if we're consistent across the board, we come up with pretty much the same 
reaction. You know, the, the generally it's the same proposals that come up to the top. So I think the key is that whoever's doing the reviewing be consistent across as they're reading all of the proposals and then, then you kind of... And we should also together. make sure the reviewer understand the process. The reviewers understand the process so that scoring is not going to be fluctuating up and down. So yeah. Well, and again, that would be the chairman of the review team's responsibility to make sure that happens. Yep. I'd like to request that you, com you give your comments back to me in, in writing uh, or through PEG so that, that we have uh, what, just exactly what you're talking about. Two mm -hmm. yeah. quick things I want to follow up Mr. Erickson is that if we, when we do, I don't know, uh, break down and make this flesh it out, have a little bit more understanding so everybody understands. Are we saying that the scoring will be adequate on its own after that? If if there is a if there is a instruction <coughs> basis where now we've informed the reviewer, we have a range, we have these criteria, we have it, and now we've gotten to this score sheet, you're still seeing the score sheet. It might be tightened up. Right. But are you still going to be okay looking at numbers? Or are you going to need the narrative, the explanation, the sentence? Well, I, I because that I'm, I'm from what I'm hearing, it sounds like you're okay with the numbers, which is right. great. But I just feel I'm going to be back here again, <laughs> and they're going to be saying, "Where's the narrative?" Right. I mean, I, I it's a really good question, and I don't know if I can I can tell you right now. I mean, at the end of the day, if the numbers make sense, then maybe they'd be fine, right? I mean, at this point. The example that brought this whole thing to this conversation is we have a situation where cost was one of the factors and the highest priced person didn't get the lowest score on cost and the lowest priced person didn't get the highest score on cost. And so you say, set was wrong, right? From a statistical perspective, it was not, you know, something didn't jive with statistically. So, so that's when my concern came in. And so I look at it, and, I, and at the, the night we ran the review, I said, hey, the numbers look good. Hey, we got everyone did the process. But that, that is a, yeah. that's a perfect example of, of where this could hit a snag, is right. that, you know, for example, with the golf course, which is kind of why we're here, we had one proposal that was one-tenth the price. Would I give them a 10 out of 10 because they were one-tenth the price? No. We felt that that was an irresponsible bid. We right. thought that he didn't get it. Right. The next person who might have come in second, third lowest, we might have rated him 5 out of 10. Why would we rank someone who's cheap 5 out of 10? Because in the review of the proposal, we felt that they were missing possibly some critical information, some professional services that others provided. So if there were... It, you know, that's part of the proposal. That's what we're looking at. So that's, that's a perfect example. But so that doesn't come out in numbers. No, but, but what I would do is if it was a, the lowest price, I would have given a 10. And then in the approach and understanding of the project, I would have given them a zero, right, or a low score. So pricing is about pricing and understanding about the project is, okay. is a different category. So, I mean, again, two people who, who've done this before look at it two different ways, right? And so we're trying to, to standardize a process where you're leaving less up to interpretation and, and more up to factual analysis. And so, I, I understand. So, thank you. Okay. Ms. Porterfield? Well, I think, Carl, uh, once we start, once we put the narrative in there, that's going to help a lot. With I that. think so. But the, to the question where when you take some of the points off, we talked about this before, Mr. Wallen. I think it's important that if someone can get a 50, and they only get a 40, but there was some reason that 10 points were, were, were deducted. I think it's important and it just makes sense. You know, and in and, and reviewing things, you know, I've done it that way before this thing. You know, the, re the, the person who convenes a meeting says, they were giving, you know, were allowed a 50, and why did you only give them 40? And even if it's just one sentence they did or lacked whatever, it's just there, everybody, it's clear, and everybody understands. It doesn't have to be a, you know, a paragraph even, <coughs> but a few sentences to understand why you would have deducted points. To me, it makes a lot of sense. I have one more thing to say about that. Okay. Um, it's still a very subjective process. Right. Mm -hmm. If you take one point off for the same thing I take 10 points off, I'm still gonna end up with, the, with number one on the proposal, and so are you. So 
trying to justify why did you take 10 off versus two or three or everything. It, it really, it's how you score. And what Peg just said is, is I think, important. If you've got 10 pers uh, proposals or 20 or two, if you, if you take them all, you, you as a rater, mm -hmm. take it all and rate it the same way. You're going to end up with a one, two, three, four, five. I am too. So the, when I don't add my score to your score. Mm -hmm. I understand that. So, you know, I think we get into why did you take one off versus I did? Well, I, I don't think that necessarily, it, but I think it does give you an, an opportunity to discuss it when, it when it comes to the table again, because maybe I missed something. And I say, I took it off because this is missing, and you're sitting next to me, and you say, well, no, I'm not, it's right there. Sometimes that comes out in the discussion. Yeah, fair, that's fair. I mean, that's, what the, that's what the meeting's for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but then to, to take that one step further and so have, have somebody say, well, why did you take two off? You know, that wasn't even part of the review, wasn't even part of the discussion at the table. Why did you take two off and not three? Or somebody else took four off? I think that's going to be, end up becoming a problem. You know, because your, your goal is, who, who's your selection? Who's your, who's your one? And, and if you sit in the room with five people, two people, we don't want two people, three, <laughs> three, some odd number. Uh, yeah. um, and you agree that this particular proposal in your world is one, in my world is one, his world may be two, mm -hmm. and we say, well, could you, you know, could you see it being one? Mm -hmm. And that's where the discussion is, but to get into the individual rating on an individual criteria, I think it's, it's not doing what we should be doing. That's what my opinion. It may, it may just be cumbersome to, to ask, you know, whoever's running this to, to be taking copious notes and stuff. I no, don't know. The, the reviewer does that. I'm talking about the reviewer oh. doing that. Reviewers giving oh, okay. deducting points. Say, I deducted points because um, they didn't have a full team. Okay. I mean, that to me is pretty, you know, availability of individuals on project team. And so if, if it's 15 and I only gave it 12 because they did not have, you know, a full team. That to me explains it. It's clear. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I, I don't see that, I don't find that um, to be, you know, too much work to do because it's just there and everybody can read it and agree. And, and if I overlook the fact that, yes, they do have a full team, then maybe I'm going to bring that score up to 15 because that becomes part of the discussion when you're reviewing these. Okay. Just to the last thing when we talked to the president was the committee member that might be the ex officio member. There was some debate on if it was one person, if that one person was with all RFPs because that one person would be familiar, or if we were going to do similar to what um, Porfio and I did with the head of the committee being involved, the nearest representative committee. However, like we talked about, uh, some of these projects, they could jump committees. So I just wanted to get that, maybe not discuss it now, it could be discussed with yourself, but in, the, in writing as well with the recommendation from how we involve uh, the council as we go forward. And, and I personally would recommend that it be rotated. I mean, I, I think just to ask any one council member to do all of them would be probably unrealistic in terms of, you know, different ones of us have different time commitments, and availabilities and stuff like that, so. I think the only key to this whole thing is that whoever the liaison to the council is, share information. Yes. I was not aware yep. that Ms. Porterfield had a two hour conversation with Chris Wallen about the process. You know what I mean? Because it fell under your committee and I wasn't in your committee. <laughs> well, this was two days ago. <laughs> But the point being is that before the process, you had a comprehensive discussion. It just needs to be communicated because although it falls within a committee, it is the entire council that ultimately votes on whether they're comfortable with how the process went. So my only suggestion in somebody being like the kind of RFP liaison would, was that person would really know the process, know how it worked, not necessarily sit in on every single process but be that, you know, point person. But I have no, I don't feel strongly about it in any way. It was just in an effort of knowing who the go-to person mm -hmm. is. Right. Yep. Well, That's all. Okay. 
that well, would we be can attack we can be better communicators yeah. about that well that would be going forward but I did discuss it with my committee because right. it was on my committee so right I, I got it but that. all yeah. six of us vote well so <laughs> that's good. going forward that's what yes. we'll do yeah all right, any other comments or suggestions? So if again, if you want to pass your suggestions to me and then I'll write them up and then give them to Bill and Chris. Thank you for your work on this. It's really great, appreciated. All right, um, I realized I was looking working on an old agenda. Um, I was ready to move on the city council seat appointment, but I guess I'm moving faster than some of you are, so we'll just hold that one for two weeks. And the last item is the proposed legislation for dealing with vaults within city right of ways. Mr. Polster. I believe that all of you have in your packet the proposed legislation. And as was outlined previously, uh, this problem became mm -hmm. extremely uh, evident as a result of the work being done on Lower State Street. It's Turned out that there are like 22 vaults down there that the city has got to deal with. And we went around uh, and discussed whether or not this should be something that we deal with on a property by property basis or put together a citywide um, procedure policy for vaults in general. And that's what is in your packet. And this will apply whether it's on I know there are faults on Crane Street, Union Street, they're basically all over the city. And what this does is it creates uh, a license agreement automatically if you've got a vault, uh, but it also provides for a written license agreement uh, in the event that there is some unusual circumstance uh, you want to uh, add a vault, there you would need permission and that would result in a um, written agreement. Uh, on Lower State Street, the way this is envisioned, uh, I'm going to be going through and every piece of property that has a vault in the right of way, they'll be given an option. If they don't care about the vault anymore uh, and it's okay to fill it in and eliminate it, that will be done. Uh, if they want the vault to remain for some reason, then uh, there would be a license agreement and outlining uh, what rights they have, what rights they don't have, what rights the city has with respect to terminating it um, in the future if circumstances <coughs> require. Uh, public hearing was on last week. Yes, last week. And as I recall, there were no speakers. Uh, with respect to the issue, uh, the proposed legislation, as I said, is before you. Questions? No? Everybody good with it? So there's no changes since the last time. There have been a couple of minor changes to tighten it up. Uh, there was a final review that I conducted. I think it was last Wednesday or Thursday. Uh, but it just, um, they were technical things. Nothing, you know, didn't change the policy or the, or the general outline. Mm -hmm. Ms. Brasso? This may not be possible, but I'm going to ask the question. Um, is it possible to get this change in legislation out to all the business owners that have vaults? Um, we don't know who they are. Okay. That's, that's the problem. And uh, when the first review, just to give you an example, when the first review was done on Lower State Street, uh, it was done by visual inspection. And they only found, it was like in the vicinity of 11 or 12 of them. And then there was a meeting and they said, well, maybe we ought to hire, I don't remember who it was, I think it was Club Harbor. And they went out there with ground penetrating radar and went along the sidewalk and they found 11 more. And so um, there are a number of vaults and, and some of them uh, are for nothing more than holding uh, utilities to service the building. There's no nothing above the sidewalk where you would even know that it was there. And 
So to answer the question, I don't know how we would do that, and I don't, I, I would not want to place that burden on the city because if we miss somebody, what are the ramifications? Especially now that the city code is online, the people that have the buildings, if they've got a vault, they can go type in vault and up will pop everything. Yeah, just as a follow-up, um, I, I think this is great, and it, we really need some clear delineation. But as a former business owner, it's like this is the kind of thing that pops up where you're like, what? You know what I mean? I, I'm responsible for this repair, and I didn't really even realize it. So, but maybe we can work with the chamber, and I'm happy to reach out to the chamber and ask them if they could, you know, just alert the businesses in the area that if you have a vault, go to the city website and review the guidelines because. You know, I, and business owners are used to it, but those nasty little surprises, not that it, it's not their responsibility, but just one of those things like be prepared because this could happen, you know, kind of thing. Um, so. I know on two abandoned properties, we found vaults that there was a potential danger, and Carl Olson had a truck filled with um, um, rubble and backed it up and poured it in. Stop them from falling in. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, you know, but uh, anyway, they're out there. We don't know where they all are. Okay. Mr. Erickson? So maybe, Lisa, your idea was pretty good. Maybe the DSIC, if it's downtown, they can notify the people. They have a way of yep. communicating. I'll reach out idea. across the board through Metroplex, too, and just ask them to just send you know, out a general blanket you know statement yeah. saying there's some changes to the. <laughs> You know, a part of the code that includes vaults, and you know, if you have a business that has one, take a look just so you know what you're responsible for. Aren't they? Aren't the vaults all over the city? Mm -hmm. like, so, and, and yes, I mean, most of them are downtown. Most of them are downtown. Okay, okay could we put in the legal notices for people that the businesses, and then it's, it's there. <laughs> hey, letting people know. I don't walk over them personally. <laughs> I'm sure that you walk over some of you don't know it's good there. And there's no concrete over it, Mary does <laughs> And Mr. Thorne pointed out it was in the legal notices when we called for a public, public hearing. hearing. Yeah. So. Great. All right, okay. so uh, we'll entertain a motion then to approve this. Okay, second. All second. in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, if there's nothing else before city development planning, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So move, second. Uh, second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, call to order government operations. Uh, just resolution was talking to the Human Rights Commission. Certainly want to make sure that we recognize Black History Month. Mm -hmm. Unless anyone has any arguments or concerns about that. No. Nope. Ask for a motion. <coughs> Second. Okay. Do you want to move it? Second. Sorry. Sorry. Second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any other business to come before government operations? No. Motion to adjourn. So moved. For the claims. I need a second. Hold on. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> okay. 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 I move we go into executive session.